Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Episode 2479. Delighted to have Spike Cohen back on the show. We got to talk about his recent debate on gun control with David Hogg, whom you know because he's become a bit of a celebrity. He was uh, one of the students at, is it Parkland High School? Yeah. Where where there was a, a school shooting, and ever since then, he's been quite outspoken on the subject of guns. Spike, you will recognize, because he was the vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party in 2020. Uh, he's got quite a background. He is a founder and president of You Are the Power, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And also, you will see him across social media in many cases where somebody has uttered yet another common misconception. You think, doggone it, I sure hope Spike Cohen is around to correct this person. And more <laughs> often than not, he, he is. He's, Almost always, yeah. He's everywhere. He's a very good communicator and very knowledgeable. So, Spike, welcome back. I'm happy to be here and apparently everywhere. I am. I, I appear to be ever-present, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. Well, you're doing great work. So, um, this this debate that you had was at Dartmouth College. Was there an official resolution that you were debating? There were two questions. Um, there wasn't a resolution, but there were two questions. And the first one was, uh, do guns make us safer or do guns make us less safe? I forget which way they went with that. And then do you support more gun restrictions? Okay. The problem is they did, uh, the, the consensus seems to be that I won the debate. But there was a bit of, I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional, but when they did the pre-debate polling, they included all the people that were watching online, the live stream, including dozens of watch parties that had been set up by my supporters. So there were, I think, over a thousand people that voted in the pre-debate polling. And then in the post-debate polling, they decided to only include the people that were in the audience, which was like, I think, 41 people. And uh, and so it, the the results showed a slight skew towards in favor of gun control, but it was the sampling had been spoiled. So right, I, unfortunately, right. I'm not sure why they did that. I don't, I don't want to say it was intentional because I have no proof of that. Right. Um, it may have just been a bunch of college kids made a, a you know, split second, you know, uh, error in judgment, but the, the results got spoiled, unfortunately. Well, what really matters ultimately is what we saw with our own eyes and ears, you know, more than yep. any bean counting, because chances are you're not going to persuade that many people in just one debate. Like, I, you know, I have a debate coming up. In fact, I'm supposed to, Gene Epstein wants me to mention this, so let me take an opportunity to do that so I don't get an angry email <laughs> from Gene. I'm actually debating COVID policy at the Soho Forum in New York City, April 23rd, yep. thesohoforum.org, if you'd like to attend that. And I highly doubt that people, hardcore pro-lockdown people, are going to say, well, I looked at Woods' charts and, you know, I'm convinced. You know, but the what chart, matters is... The charts is, had me. I yeah, was right. scared at my core. My <laughs> my support for the COVID policies is largely based on fear porn that I was fed while I wasn't, while I felt like I wasn't safe to leave my home. But then Tom Woods showed me yeah. some charts and by exactly. gosh, I had no idea I was being lied to. <laughs> so e even though, of course, you know, we're, we're only human, we want to say we won. What, what really matters is that we have that permanent statement out there for as many yep. persuadable people to see as possible. So before yep. the thing got started, I mean, I will say I, I was pleased that, you know, his attitude, I don't know if conciliatory is the right word, but friendly is definitely right. Like he didn't come in there wanting to humiliate you or elbow you rhetorically. Uh, he, I think he was genuine when he said, I, I just want to have a, a conversation. Did you have a chance to talk to him before or after? And what was your impression? So we had a pre-debate Zoom meeting where we were told what the the um, the rules of the debate were going to be and the overall uh, purpose behind it. And um, the the general consensus was we didn't want this to be something where people walked away going, wow, that was a mess or holy crap, that was crazy. They wanted to walk away feeling like an actual debate had been had. And, and David and I both agreed on that and also agreed that we'd rather focus on saying we disagree on how to deal with this, not you want more people to die or you want us to live under communism or, or, or under dictatorship right. or something like that. But instead, we both think murder is bad. We both think violence is bad. And we think that our way of handling it is the right way and their way of handling it is the wrong way. Um, but no, from the beginning, um, we both wanted to go into this 
to have an actual debate, not a, a screaming match or bad faith accusations or anything like that, but an actual debate. I think that that was largely had. Um, yeah. And uh, and I, I do think that, and this is not a, a, a knock on David as much as it is on the gun control side in general, they have to focus on anecdotes and emotion. Because yes. the data is not on their side. The law is definitely not on their side. The Second Amendment is very clear that it is uh, affirming a pre-existing natural right to keep and bear arms. <clears throat> but the data also isn't on their side. There is no correlation between gun ownership and murder or even gun murder. There aren't even more murders by gun that are correlated with gun ownership. So right. if you watch, I focused on charts and data. He focused on what people feel like. But it was, right, I right, guess, right. We were, it was a conciliatory debate, yeah. It is a shame that they weren't able to, um, to to put your slides up on a big screen, which would, which obviously would have been a lot, lot better for you. But this I really was is, doing this. I'm like, look at this. Yeah, look, look, look at how Even close. from the back, you can sort of see the dots. <laughs> They're over here. But, <laughs> and they should look like this if your position is correct. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, I, I'm actually going to be putting out like a, a bit of a highlight reel from Good. it. And we're going to superimpose the actual Good. chart so people can see what it was. Yeah, and I'm also yeah, going to yeah. put a link to a to a, uh, a sub stack that was created that has all of that information and how they compiled it. But, you know, what you were saying before, that obviously, you know, neither of you are in favor of murder and all that. It really is a classic case of what the economists say. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. Only trade-offs, yeah. Nobody has a solution to murder. What we simply yes. want to do is minimize violence and minimize deaths. Yes. So, yes. All right, and, so let, and let, I want to dig we, into... Oh, go ahead. When we, well, just when we focus on the tool, what ends up happening is we create more criminality. The... the reason there's no correlation between guns and, and murder or violent crime is because the correlation is with overall criminality. And there's a, a thousand different things that contribute to criminality overall, if, you, if you're speaking societally. When you increase gun control or the war on drugs or any other kind of criminalization, you're making people into criminals who otherwise wouldn't have been criminals. And you're basically pushing them into the, for lack of a better word, the criminal world. And so you're actually, you're creating black markets, you're empowering cartels and gangs, and you're actually increasing criminality, which increases the amount of violence. So it's not more guns, less violence, less guns, more violence. It's if you criminalize the tool instead of focus on what causes criminality, you just have more criminality, which means you're going to have more murder. At one point you were talking about, we'll get to Europe in a minute, but you were talking about comparing yep. states within the United States and you gave the example of Vermont, you gave the example of New Hampshire itself where the debate yep. was held as examples of places with relatively high gun ownership rates and yet low murder rates. And I was, I people will say, well, you shouldn't have been surprised. Well, I was a little bit surprised when Hogg, his initial response to you was, well, there are fewer people in Vermont. Like he thought you were talking raw numbers and you immediately said, no, yeah. this is per capita. So therefore- mm -hmm. He thought that this just had to be a raw numbers question, but now that you corrected him, no, it's per capita. What's what's his response? You know, I mean, is he is he genuinely unfamiliar with the numbers? Is the question? I I believe he is. So, uh, it's he's not unfamiliar with the numbers. He's familiar with the wrong numbers. So uh, here's okay. what the gun control side does. You'll notice they always say gun violence. Gun violence is five things. Suicides, which make up two thirds and growing of the share of gun violence, as all of the other forms of gun violence continue to drop and suicides after many years of dropping has started rising, it's making up a bigger and bigger share. It's the only reason that gun violence is rising because everything else is dropping. So you got suicides, you've got homicides, which for decades have been on a long term trend of dropping. You have uh, justified killings, which as the crime rate drops, so does the, the, the uh, correlating rate of justified killings. You have um, you have police killings, which also tends to rise and fall with the crime rate. The crime rate's going down, so police killings are going down. And then you have accidents, which have dropped by over by around 90% over just the last 40 years at a time when licensing is at its all-time lowest, proving that licensing never made us more safe from uh, gun accidents. Um, but all of those are dropping. Accidents are, are becoming a non-factor at this point. It's suicides. This is a suicide mm. problem. So what they'll do is they'll use the thankfully very rare instances of mass shootings, and then they'll couple that with a graph saying gun violence is on the rise. No, suicide is on the rise. The actual, when people think gun violence, they think murder. Murder yeah. has been dropping for years as the uh, rates of gun ownership have continued to go up. 
uh, as the number of restrictions, the net number of restrictions on our ability to own guns has gone down, proving that this is not a gun problem. Gun violence is a suicide problem. It is not a, it is not a, uh, uh, a murder problem. It is not, it, it is, it is, it is just the only thing that's going up is suicides. So we're facing a mental health issue. People are feeling increasingly hopeless. That's not a gun problem. But I think, if I remember this correctly, Hogg was trying to make the case that even though, yes, it obviously you do need to disaggregate the data and understand that yep. this is not all me pointing a gun at somebody and, and killing them. Correct. But, but the thing is that there are a lot of ways somebody could attempt suicide and given how effective guns are, whereas other methods might not be as effective, I might fail at it some other way and live to tell the tale. Whereas if I, yes. if I have a gun, I might actually be more successful. Yes, yes, and that's true. But that's like blaming murders on guns. You have to focus on why people are doing it, not blaming the tool. Yes, often, if someone truly is trying to uh, end their life and not just it's a cry for help, or something like that. They're going to they're going to try to use the most effective tool. Just like if you want to murder someone, you're more likely to try to use the most effective tool. You don't blame the tool. You you look at why someone reached a point of saying I want to do this and then you focus on that because yes, they're going to use the most effective tool, but even if you were somehow able to magically remove the tool, they're still going to do it. They'll just do it another way. Um we we actually have proof of this. Um the only data that anyone has been able to present to prove that red flag laws work is a couple of studies that showed that it reduced the gun suicide rate. It didn't reduce the suicide rate. It reduced the gun suicide mm. rate. In other words, someone was demonstrating to, to their loved ones that they might be wanting to kill themselves. They red flagged them. They came in, they took their guns, and they still killed themselves. It's not a gun problem. It is a mental health problem. Yes, they will use the most effective tool available if they truly do want to end it. But we need to focus on the fact that they want to end it, not how they're choosing to do so. Because again, when we do that, we're just creating more of the conditions that lead to more criminality and lead to more hopelessness. I think um, part of what's motivating Hogg is he lived through this traumatic experience yep. and he wants to think of, he, he does reiterate, I'm not saying that we need to disarm the population. I've never thought that. I just think we could do a better job keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people, such yep. as the the person involved in the school shooting I lived through. And yep. so he has various recommendations for things, perhaps mm -hmm. red flag laws. But uh, what very often happens is people will advocate various laws in the wake of a shooting that if you look at them after the fact, you realize that law would not actually have prevented that shooting. No. In the same way that regulations after a financial crash you look at them and you realize, but none of these would have stopped the, the crash. Um, no, especially especially when the reason that Nicholas Cruz was not already being uh, looked at, not just looked at, but investigated and prosecuted for the threats he had made was because the justice system and law enforcement had failed. It wasn't because red flag laws weren't in place. They had more than enough evidence to go and actually do something about it. But that sheriff of that county wanted to say that there was less crime happening. That That's the allegation I've heard anyway, is that that sheriff wanted to show that less crime was happening. And so he was kind of having the, the brakes pumped on any kind of prosecutions or actions. Let's say that wasn't the case. I, whatever the reason was, maybe they just, the law enforcement, it, it slipped under the cracks. That slipped through the cracks. That's not an argument to eliminate due process with red flag laws. That's an argument for law enforcement to do their jobs right. You don't reward law enforcement for doing their jobs wrong by saying, we're going to make it easier by not having due process and anyone can just accuse anyone else. And that's a perfect example of what you're saying. If you look at it retroactively, a red flag law wasn't going to stop him because the current laws that should have been able to stop him didn't stop him. The, the problem was a failure of law enforcement. Uh, you don't reward that by eliminating due process. Uh, something I wish I had known prior to the debate, I found out afterwards, um, David kept mentioning how Nicholas Cruz was using high capacity magazines. No, he wasn't. He used 10 round magazines, which are legal in California. So it, that, that also wasn't true. But yeah, no, these, these regulations um, aren't going to stop people from wanting to kill. What they are going to do is make it harder to legally own a firearm. And that doesn't make us safer. And if it did, 
as I said with the chart, you would see that the the more guns per people there were in a state, the higher the the uh, the murder rate would be, the gun murder rate would be, and it would be you know a, a, almost like a, a perfect uh, um, um, diagonal line. We saw it looked like I had just sprinkled a bunch of jimmies on a on a uh, on on a piece of paper. Hey everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. What if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. It's it's so interesting uh, and and arresting, you might say, when you see a chart that tells you the opposite of what you've been led to believe by all major influences. And again, this the yep. parallel yep. with COVID is very clear because you'd think, well, the more stringent the lockdown regime, the better the health outcomes. But instead, again, instead of seeing a, a nice, clean demonstration of that, you just see dots all over the place. Yep. And you shouldn't, yep. shouldn't be that way. So so the, the charts are very, very important. Um, let me ask you, uh, he more than once... He he did he put he took he made a move that a lot of uh, folks who not just on the gun issue like to make against people like you and me by saying, "Well, your your rights aren't absolute because after all, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater." You let him get away with that the first time because it's a rhetorical trope. But the second yes. time, you finally said, "Look, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it." The so libertarian in me a, why came is that a bad out. argument? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not true. So the that. Uh, the the statement, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, was made by a Supreme Court justice to justify a law against protesting war. It was a law that was being, uh, that had been, I think it was a, a, a strengthening of the Alien and Sedition Acts during the World War I era. They were basically trying to make it illegal on a federal level to question the government's actions in World War I. And one of the Supreme Court justices who supported making that illegal or restricting it said, well, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, yeah, yeah, you can. You le Legally, you can. In doing so, you are likely violating the rules of the private property, the theater in which you're doing it, and right. they can make you leave. And if you don't, you can be trespassed. But you can't be arrested just for saying fire or yelling fire in a theater. I wouldn't recommend it. And yeah, you you can and should be kicked out of that property, but you're not, that's a private property thing. That is not against the law. And I let it go the first time because I said, you know what? There's, we only have like a minute to respond or 30 yeah. seconds to respond. I got way bigger fish to fry. And then he brought it up again and went, no, I'm going to do the libertarian thing and like <laughs> tell him you are wrong on the thing that probably matters the least in, in this discussion. But yeah, no, it's a terrible argument. And, um, and it's, it's one that is used to try to say your rights aren't absolute. Your rights are absolute and they are inviolable, as are the private property rights of the theater owner who doesn't want people in there shouting fire and so they can kick you out for it. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the answer. So it's, it's not so much that I can, I can shout fire in my own home. I can shout fire you know, where I want to, where, where people consent to that. But as yep. you say, it's a it's a matter of the private property owner sets the private rules, property, right. and very few property owners are going to approve of you of you disrupting um, their proceedings. So exactly. But, but let's get to that Second Amendment issue, though, because yep. his point wasn't so much about shouting fire. His point was uh, we have to have some sensible restrictions on the Second Amendment because you know you because your rights aren't absolute, um, and and this one might be a little tricky. Because, you know, radical libertarians, as you well know, Spike, have argued for some time about, you know, can I have my own nuke and th this and that? So, where, <laughs> you know, there's nobody around. All, we're all friends here. Where do you yes, come yes, down yes. On, on that issue? Yeah, let's talk about the nuke thing. Um, there's only one 
organization that wants the ability to commit mass murder, and it's it's the government. I want to be very clear about something. The reason that the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezoses and Bill Gates of the world, who frankly are the only people that actually have the means to own and maintain a nuke, like that, this is not something, it's not if we said nukes are legal, there would be nukes are us. We're talking billions of dollars that have to be invested in developing, uh, creating and maintaining nuclear weapons. And the reason that these, uh, that these individuals, these handful of individuals that could afford the means to have a nuke don't have one isn't because uh, there's a law that says you can't have them. I mean, there was a literal pedophile island. There's nothing stopping the wealthy and powerful from having nukes if they want them. They don't want them because what the hell would you want a mass murder machine for? The only organization or entity that has any reason to want the ability to ma indiscriminately massacre an entire section of the planet is the government. The reason that our nuclear production was focused so heavily on the on creating byproduct which could be used to develop weapons instead of focusing on the energy creation aspect was because it was the government that was directing how the nuclear energy output was being done this is a government problem and it is it is something to be said that we whenever we're talking about gun control we are essentially saying guns are dangerous we can't trust individuals uh, no rights are absolute. We should be restricting it. And so we should put in charge the only entity who ever discusses or wants the ability to be able to destroy an entire section of the planet with nuclear weapons. It is actually the biggest argument or a, a one of the strongest arguments against gun control is that we'd be putting it in the hands of the people who have both the means and the only ones who have the desire to commit to have the ability to commit that kind of mass murder to begin with. At, at one point, Hogg said that he, quote, feels safer <clears throat> when he's in Europe because in Europe he knows he has a, a much, much lower chance of, of, of experiencing gun violence. Yes. So, and this is a very, very common thing, the comparison with Europe. How do you mm -hmm. tackle that? Well, only Western Europe and a couple of countries in Central Europe and Scandinavia. Definitely not Eastern Europe where, where they are not less safe, except for a handful of countries like the Czech Republic that have been uh, loosening their restrictions on gun ownership and now have some of the lowest murder rates uh, on the continent. Um, you'll notice they always talk about Europe. They don't talk about Latin America. They don't talk about Africa. They don't talk about most of Asia, most of uh, East and Southeast Asia. Um, they're, they're talking about a specific cherry-picked subsection and go, yes, here I feel safer. Okay, that's because there's less criminality there. And we could talk for hours about all of the conditions and, and the, the things that lead to more criminality in an area. It's not the guns. If it was the guns, and again, let's use Europe as an example. The Czech Republic at one point had some of the, coming out of the Soviet Union, had some of the highest murder rates in Europe. One of the actions they have taken was to loosen the restrictions. They still have permits and things like that. I'm not going to claim they're a libertarian utopia or anything like that when it comes to murders, but they loosen the restrictions on gun, on gun ownership. Partially as a result of that, they are now among the safest countries in Europe. Um, in, uh, in El Salvador, one of, the, uh, one of the actions that the president there, Bukele, has made is to make it easier for law-abiding private uh, individuals to be able to own firearms. Again, there's still a permitting process and all of that. I'm not claiming it's libertarian utopia, but as a result, as at least a partial result of that, El Salvador has gone from being the most dangerous place on earth to having a murder rate that's, I think, a bit lower than the United States. So again, this is not a gun problem. Um, I'm not even claiming that guns in and of themselves make us less, uh, more safe. I'm saying that they're a tool and they can either be a tool to defend us, or they can be a tool to harm us. That is up to the individual who is wielding that tool. And if you want to look at criminality, things like murder, you have to look at the criminality, not the tool. If you want to look at suicide and how to address that, you have to look at the conditions that lead to suicide, not the tool. At, at one point, the subject of gun buybacks came up, and I like that you even took the time to clarify that that's a misnomer because it, who's buying it back? That implies that the government yeah. owned it to begin with. But but yeah. leaving that aside, it's like that 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 irritating expression about how he, I, I you know I gave something back to society. But we yes. get out of here with this. It just yes it's, it's yes a, 
it's a misconception. But 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 what's the actual record of these gun buybacks? I actually didn't know about this till uh, the debate. The left is abandoning this idea because their own studies are showing that it's useless. And they're actually becoming increasingly hostile to the idea of pushing gun buybacks because it, what it's becoming is it's becoming a tool of police departments to kind of virtue signal that, look, we, we bought all these guns and look at these. We finally got your grandpa's prize six shooter off the street. And, and they'll show these guns and it's like, you know, a combination of, of you know, old hunting rifles and, and you know, uh, um, uh, uh, heirlooms, heirloom relic guns that probably don't even work. And uh, a handful of pistols. And then uh, you have people show up and 3D print a bunch of lower receivers and walk away with $10,000 worth of gift cards. You know, you, you have all this and it doesn't it doesn't do anything. And so it is actually the the uh, anti-gun left uh, in the Atlantic and the Trace and CNN and many other articles who were saying this doesn't work. You know, we need to push for, you know, obviously they'll be saying we need to push for assault weapons bans and we need to push for red flag laws and we need to push for handgun bans and all of this. I wish they'd also look at the studies that show that those don't work either. But in this case, there's never been, I think there's been either 10 or 12 studies. Every single one of them have shown that it was absolutely useless. It did nothing. And it may, and it intuitively just consider someone who is thinking of committing some unspeakable violent crime. Do you think they're thinking, huh, I want to rack up this huge body count and kill as many as people as possible, but the police are offering me a $100 Whole Foods gift card if I go and give it to them and say, like, it's just the stupidest thing on earth. So, no, it is incredible. That's why I said it's it's amazing to me that one of the centerpieces of David's organization's policies, March for Our Lives policies, is to push for these so-called gun buybacks when everyone is abandoning them and saying they don't work. This might be a little tricky, but... Was there any part of the debate where you thought to yourself, well, you know, he scored a point there or, um, you know, I disagree with him, but I, I hear where he's coming from. Or was it was it just all platitudes? There were many points where I I believed where he was coming from um, and 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 said, yeah, I get where you're coming from. And and like when he talked about during the Q&A, he had mentioned his opposition to uh, the extension of the Patriot Act and to. Uh, warrantless, uh, you know, wiretapping and things like that. And I'm thinking, yes, but that's the same police state you want to empower with gun control. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that this is wrong. And he's also a big opponent of the, the war on drugs. He's also, uh, interestingly enough, this didn't come up in the debate, but we talked about it afterwards. Um, he's a, a big opponent to some of the overly burdensome zoning restrictions that are, are making it harder for the market to be able to meet housing and, and commercial needs. And I'm like, yeah, but Okay, so you understand the government can be weaponized against people and that regulations very often are more harmful than effective, but then you support it for gun control. I think the one time that he got me was when uh, I, <laughs> the, many people have, have seen this, when he brought up the fact that one of the, the sources that was cited in, in one of my charts was uh, a Wikipedia article. The Wikipedia article was a compilation of data from like 80 different countries because it was it was comparing gun ownership rates to uh, gun murder rates. Well, rather than have like some bibliography, you know, uh, it's single spaced uh, printed out page of all of these different countries, I found a Wikipedia article that that had compiled where someone had compiled all that information from these different countries. And so he said, I would have been kicked out of my uh, out of my debate class if um, if I had brought this. And I thought, well, what would they have done if all you brought was anecdotes and what you felt about Europe? But <laughs> regardless, that was probably that was probably the one time he got me, quote unquote. But it's become kind of a meme online where people are like, what's your source, Wikipedia? It's like, yeah, you got it. But um, yeah, no, overall, I, I, I felt pretty solid in, in what was going on. Uh, what I was presenting, even including that thing with the 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 Wikipedia compilation of uh, data from dozens of different countries. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here with another word on behalf of the outstanding monetary medals, where I have been very happy to have an account because I earn interest on my gold paid in gold. And I'm very happy to be joined today for this extremely brief mini interview with Addison Qualley, who actually works for monetary metals. How'd that come about? Uh, and I think you have a job where you actually really believe in what you do. That's correct, Tom. Uh, basically, I am the VP of relationships here at the company. Um, I've been here since 2013. And I, I basically lead the sales department and help people come on board monetary metals 
uh, and help handle their accounts. Um, I've always been a, a big fan of freedom. Uh, somehow along the way, uh, was a fan of freedom just from high school. That really kicked up a notch when I started following your show in, in 2013. And um, I was working at a gold company at the time. Um, I came to understand that gold is honest money and a very good thing. And um, when I learned about monetary metals uh, back then, uh, around 2016, it just seemed like something that could really change the world for good. Uh, if you can earn interest on gold and finance in gold, um, that is potentially world changing and you can get gold to come back into the monetary system. So that really excited me. I jumped ship from my old company. I joined Monetary Metals back then. And, um, you know, one of the exciting ideas we had in our head was at the time, Uber was kind of taking out the New York City taxi cabs and Uber had gone viral. And we thought, you know, if interest on gold, if earning yield on gold could go viral, uh, maybe that could, uh, become a legitimate alternative to the dollar. And um, we're, we're excited to be growing a lot uh, since then. Uh, the company's grown by leaps and bounds, and um, it's been a very exciting journey. Well, I'm very glad to be able to be a very small part of it. So find out more and join me. Open up your own account with Monetary Metals. Head over to monetary-metals.com slash woods to get more information. That's monetary-metals.com slash woods. By the way, how did this come about? Like, how did they choose you? Um, just what's the background on it? Uh, the background is Dartmouth Political Union reached out to my scheduling people and said, would Spike do a debate with David Hogg on gun control? And we thought it was like some kind of hypothetical, like if we could get this to work, would it happen? Would we do it? We were like, yeah, we'll do it. And, uh, and they said, okay, great. Uh, let's start scheduling it. So apparently they had already reached out to David I believe, I believe that was the order. They had reached out to David and said, would you do a debate with Spike Cohen on gun control? And he said, yeah, too. Or maybe it happened at the same time. So I was shocked that he that he would even want to do this. I, I, I know he was on the Harvard debate team when he was in college, but I've never seen him do any kind of debate since then or, or anything like that. I've mostly seen him do agreeable press interviews, which I guess if you run a nonprofit, that's probably the best way to go about it. But um, I was actually surprised that he did it. Um, and, and like I said, and you saw it as well, I, he didn't come in and he did one time try to accuse me of selling guns, which he is the undisputed champion for selling guns. Yeah. But yeah you had other a very good that, comeback I, for that. Yeah. Other, yeah. Other, other than that, I, I felt like it was a good faith discussion where we talked about where we disagreed and I, I'm, I'm glad it was that, but yeah, that's how it started. He asked us if I, we were asked if, if we do it and I said, yeah, I'd be happy to hypothetically. And they said, great, let's start scheduling. <laughs> I was shocked. I was honestly shocked that it happened. Yeah, I couldn't believe it either. I thought this was going to be great. I, this is like a dream. <laughs> it's like Scott Horton debating Bill Crystal. How'd this happen? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. and while I do believe that I won the debate, I think you know everyone can watch it and see for themselves. Um, I think the biggest win was for Lily Tong Williams and the possibility that we may be getting a libertarian in Congress uh, a largely because this, her asking David that question and it going just viral and her becoming a darling on, in the pro gun world and on the right writ large, uh, that will likely propel her, uh, in her run to, to get elected to Congress. Cause the Democrats already dropped out of her race. The incumbents already dropped out. Whoever wins that Republican primary is almost certain to be the next congressperson representing uh, New Hampshire second district. So the biggest win here might be that we end up with a liber another libertarian in Congress. But not everybody knows the question she asked, though. Oh, well, uh, a lot do because she, <laughs> it's been seen tens of millions of times, far more than the debate itself. Uh, Lily Tong Williams uh, is a survivor of uh, the Great Leap Forward and Mao's Cultural Revolution. Uh, she, uh, she is a strict, strongly, strongly anti-communist and, uh, and a, 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 a libertarian. She's a Republican, but she's a small L libertarian. And in the debate, uh, in the Q&A session, she gets up and says, David, uh, I am a survivor of Mao's cultural revolution. I've seen firsthand what a, a dictatorship can do. Can you guarantee to me that our government will never become tyrannical? And David says, obviously, unfortunately, I can't guarantee that to you. And she said, well, then the debate on gun control is over. You will never take my guns from me. I will never, I have seen what dictatorship can do. And I will always keep my guns, if for nothing else, to defend myself. And you, David, should go over and see what communism has done. The one bad thing that happened there is that, uh, uh, or, or I shouldn't say the bad thing, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people don't realize David's response to that 
was him telling her how much of an anti-communist he is. He actually is a devout anti-communist, believe mm. it or not. He's like an old school, liberal, progressive anti-communist. Um, had we had more time to discuss it, we could talk about the fact that, yeah, you might be anti-communist and that's great. But one of the first things in order for any kind of authoritarian dictatorship has to do in order to be able to take over the country and, and centrally plan most of the people into starving to death is taking their weapons so that they can't defend themselves against it. Tell us about You Are the Power. Sure, absolutely. So I started You Are the Power as a proof of concept in 2021, and we officially launched in 2022. We find people who are being abused by their local governments. We organize our thousands of activists and the public at large to rally around that cause, and we fight to get them the respect and the justice that they should have gotten from day one. And we don't stop until we win, and we do a lot of winning. Um, we have stopped eminent domain abuse. We have stopped zoning abuse. We have stopped small businesses from being destroyed. We have stopped great grandparents from being forced to leave their family homes. Uh, we have because the the uh, bylaws in that community didn't consider great uh, grandparents to be immediate family. Uh, we have stopped a lot of really bad things, and our big focus right now is uh, stopping uh, the abuse of uh, child protective services, which has led to multiple families having innocent parents having their sick children being torn from them and the government knowing what they're doing is wrong and, and doing the same thing anyway. So if anyone wants to find out more about what we're doing with You Are The Power, uh, you can go to youarethepower.net. You can see the causes we're working on and you can find out how you can help us by becoming a member. All right, tremendous. Youarethepower.net. Check that out. I'll also link uh, in the description below the video as well as on uh, the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2479 to the debate itself, of course, because where would we be if there hadn't been a debate in the first place? So <laughs> I'll have that linked and you, you will enjoy watching it uh, without a yeah. doubt. But Spike, I appreciate this kind of, um, uh, you know, post-game wrap-up conversation about it. I was really glad that it happened and, and you did a great job. And, and I'm also glad that it really, it genuinely did shed uh, more light than heat, which is a very, very rare thing. So uh, thanks very much again. Thank you, Tom, and thanks for having me on again. Hopefully, we can do it more often. Hopefully, I can be your your twenty five hundred. I just, it, you're up to almost twenty five hundred. I know. Like, what am I trying to prove at this point, Spike? I really? had a show, and I think we had like eighty something episodes, and that was mind blowing. I don't know how you do this. It is it's insane to me. You've been to twenty. Oh gosh. But then, but you but know, then, on the yes. other hand, then we have Scott Horton, who's been around over 20 years, and he looks at 2,500 episodes and he thinks, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Clearly, I was a lightweight in the podcasting world, but seriously, thank you for having me on, and, uh, and I look forward to coming on again in the future. Pleasure is mine, Spike. Thanks so much, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.